Coming at you from the frozen tundra that is East Central Alberta, Canada, streaming live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, Telegram, and Rumble. Oh, and Odyssey as well. <laughs> Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. I am Toolman Tim. Today is February 25th, 2023, and this is episode 263 of the Workshop Podcast. And you might wonder who this hooded individual is to my right or left. Oh my God, you got a glare just like I do. How are you, Carrie Brown? <laughs> I'm doing great, buddy. Good. This is going to be fun. We So this is Carrie's, I think, fourth appearance, at least on the podcast. I and think so. I'm a fanboy. We went uh, three episodes ago, we did the Ferengi <laughs> Rules of Acquisition, which was a lot of fun. We almost could revisit that someday, because I think there was lots we didn't touch on. Yes. But Art Bell seems to be... Uh, so, I checked earlier, and the well, one reason we're coming back to do this is because, you know, Art and Coast to Coast is a huge, you know, um, treasure trove of stuff we can pull out of, but the episode did gangbusters. So, normally... You know, we do a live stream and I get, you know, maybe 100, 200 views on the live stream, a lot more on the podcast download. Well, this one has been not just my biggest live stream, but my biggest video since. It's coming on 10,000 views since we've done it. <laughs> awesome. So kind of crazy, but yeah, it that's is. There's wonderful. Obviously a hunger for it. And hell, I love talking about him. I think, I think he's just an interesting dude and I've probably listened to as much or if not more since last time you and I were on as opposed to before because we were just coming out of ghost to ghost season last time and I kind of get into his stuff. But um, so let's, yeah, let's recap real quick. I just wanted to share for anybody who's coming in kind of the main reason. Well, there's a few reasons, but I grew up listening to talk radio, love talk radio. Um, I also was a, an X-Files junkie and I read all the conspiracy magazines as a teenager in the 90s and always loved it. Never listened to uh, Art Bell because I was in Canada, didn't really know about it. Found out about him about a year ago, kind of got really interested talking to Carrie and uh, maybe share a couple of memories you have of listening to him back in the day, Carrie. Yeah, so I I probably found Art when I was working third shift doing... Um, security at various job sites which mostly required just riding around in a van and trying to make sure people didn't steal cigarettes off of loading docks sure so um it was as you can imagine quite the quite the boring job and difficult to stay awake and i was just of course we're way free smartphone at this point so i'm just punching through the radio one night and uh i hear this cool voice this real mellow uh but engaging voice and um tuned in and I don't even remember what the topic was that night, but I was like, cause I, I never really was into talk radio all that much. Sure. Um, I, I was around people who like to listen to sports talk, which I, I could not stand, but this <laughs> guy held my attention. So, and I also noticed that, you know, today, like when I was kind of reviewing my notes for our show and kind of um, adding some bullet points and I was looking at different conversation threads, Reddit, places like that. Yeah. Art Bell is still like, well within the public consciousness like he is not being forgotten the way others may have been no like i i'm on uh so for those who don't use reddit i go on um reddit so they they have what they call subreddits on there and so r slash art bell has got 6500 members and I, i'm gonna go out on a limb but i think the art bell subreddit gets more posts than the coast to coast subreddit which is still live and has George Norrie hosting and has new shows every day. But people just took to Art Bell. He had, like you said, he had that, he had a persona, you know, doing the show live from his home in the middle of the desert. And he had that voice that only people who have smoked for 50 years have on the radio, you know, yep. <laughs> he was just an interesting dude. So last time we went and we, we went through quite a few 
of our favorite guests and some of our favorite memories. And of course, me, memories are more just what I found and enjoyed. It's, it's kind of fun. So there was a couple other things I wanted to touch on right quick. So I wanted to shout out to the Coast to Coast PM guys. They don't know us, but uh, Paul and Chris, we, um, I've listened to some. I've intentionally not listened to their hail bop episodes because I want, I know you have, but I just wanted to come in with it fresh. But those guys are doing an episode a week dealing with coast to coast, modern stuff and old stuff. But I've learned a ton from them. So if you're looking for another podcast, listen to them. Uh, we already talked about the subreddit from Art Bell, uh, the Art Bell subreddit, which I think is just awesome. It's fun to be able to go in there every day and learn something new about somebody who has been, you know, how long? He died in 17, I think, 2017. So, yeah. So you sent me a bunch of your favorite clips, this or um, your, your favorite guests, favorite episodes and whatnot. So I'm going to play one at a time as we go through just, you know, a minute or two of each thing, and we're going to discuss them. But before we do that, I wanted to open with, did you ever hear or listen to Art talk about the time him and his wife uh, had an alien encounter? The big black triangle UFO. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we got Sean Ryan in here. He says, Art has a cult following. He died in 2018. I was close. So good to have you, Sean. So yeah, um, I found a clip from CBS from, I don't know how long ago. It's about three minutes, but I'm going to open with that because I think it gives us a, an insight into his mind of, because this was in 94, which was really the time that he was ramping up the conspiracy and extraterrestrial stuff on the show. So mm-hmm. let's see if we can bring, let's share this. And, whoops, here we are. We'll bring me and you in here and we'll play this. And I, um, oh, man. Light at it. It, it, it. And if you are among the believers, you have probably spent at least a few late nights listening to the program broadcast from this desert compound. Coast to Coast with Art Bell is the place to talk about UFOs, or ufology, as many of his listeners call it. Uh, West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hey, Art. This is Matt in Colorado. Hey, Matt. Hey, um, got a sighting for you that happened last summer. Oh? It was huge, a cigar shape. The common cause of ufology is to finally determine what in the hell is flying in our skies. It hurt your eyes, so I turned away. When I looked back, it's gone. I think that uh, Coast to Coast AM is the main conduit for ufology information. And um, over my phone lines have come the most informed ufologists, the best scientists, and some of the craziest people you'll ever meet. <laughs> and I uh, was moving very slowly with the cloud cover. It, def- and I, and it I definitely never- overflew New York City. And I never heard about a triangular uh, UFO until I looked it up. And I you found almost that always treated his guests with respect, yep. eh? Hey? Coast to Coast began as a, actually a political show, kind of like everybody else's uh, political show that radio is infested with. <laughs> and one day I got sick of doing the same damn thing over and over again, the same politics over and over. And I, I, I began to sort of inject a little... Well, a different kind of programming, you know, aliens and... Three points of light. The weird thing about them... Was Coast to Coast became the fourth most popular program on American radio. It was really weird. Like they were doing a dance? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And huh. they went over the rooftop. I think we're fascinated with the whole concept of alien intelligence because it would be so strange if we were all alone. Imagine for a There's moment how there, it guys. would feel if we were this all alone. Trailer. If there was this no other great, life, great other intelligent life anywhere in all that you see out there. Art Bell and his wife Ramona say they encountered something from out there in 1994. <laughs> we were on the way home from Las Vegas, about a half mile from where we're standing at the moment. I just happened to look out the rear view, the rear view mirror and just saw something coming up from behind us. And it looked like it it wasn't normal. Normal, and I, I kept saying, "What? What the hell is that?" And this thing floated above our heads, doing about thirty miles That's a good an hour. Word, float. yeah. Floated, yeah, it floated, uh, or defied. Had to have been defying gravity, or it was a lighter than air craft. I don't know, but it was triangular. It was monstrous. The moon and the stars went away. 
and there it was above us. And we stood and watched it go across the valley and head toward the mountains. Art Bell and his wife were alone. You ever had a close encounter, Carrie? <clears throat> I've only... I've seen some odd lights and that sort of thing. I've never seen anything as dramatic as uh, as what Art describes. But um, I have I have known people who have seen things and, you know, have told me, you know, in person and you can kind of tell that they were weirded out by it and that they were, uh, they, you could just tell by a person's demeanor when not something they're done settling and they're not full of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought it was cool. It was, um, we got, uh, Hey Pipin showed him out in the comments there. I loved, it was such a time capsule to see this behind the scenes footage of art in his radio, you know, in his station. And, Art was almost a podcaster before podcasting was a thing because he he was doing radio from home, which wasn't mm -hmm. a very uh, co common thing in the 90s. So, you know, as we sit here in a, my basement, your shed, sipping on our drinks like he was, he was the pioneer to do this kind of thing. He really was. And he was doing his own thing. I don't think he gave, you know, too many craps about what people thought, obviously, because he was getting into, the, you know, certain topics and territory that were untouched at the time so very untouched. I, I admired that about him the 90s was an interesting time for talk radio you know you had you had rush limbaugh you had howard stern and you had art bell all mm -hmm. doing different things you know i don't i guess rush limbaugh was pushing the envelope but i can tell you that um, howard stern was most definitely dealing with topics that people didn't deal with and so was art bell and yeah. it was yeah i think people had a, a real hunger for that kind of stuff for sure especially, especially crazy people who were up uh <laughs> late at night right right hey as a side note um are yes. you aware of the website that is the national ufo reporting center i am not plug that into your browser sometime there are logs of um people people send in their information they they used to send it by mail and now it of course archived online emailed in and it's always like you can search by city, state, zip code, or whatever. So plug in your uh, your postal code sometime and see what's been in the skies. Yeah, I will. That's awesome. I yeah, I got to. Oh, that's cool. I want to throw this out. Stri striker mom, a uh, striker man says, I've often said that Art Bell is the only famous person who passed away that I truly missed. I like hearing that. That's cool. And Renegade Butcher said, so many fond memories of listening to Art Bell late at night. I. I decided, and this will sound maybe a little cheesy, but when I was driving from prepper camp to um, tactical response, I had kind of that six, seven hour drive all after dark, you know, the roads there. So I had some old episodes of Art Bell and I figured, hey, he's not on the radio anymore, but I might as well listen to him after dark driving on the highway. And it was, yeah, there's just something about his, his cadence, his delivery, his content, just a cool dude. Mm -hmm. And, um, he said, I remember, uh, Packrat says, I remember the lawsuit in Nashville between him and David Hinkson and WWCR involving slander against them. They had to retract. Huh. I wonder if, uh, we'll have, yeah. You know what? For the record, there is enough <laughs> content that you and I could do, um, a bunch of these episodes. Let's just say that. So, oh, yeah. So the first one you sent me was, uh, okay, so we did Art's Alien Encounter. The next one was Gordon Michael Scallion. Do you want to talk about that dude a little bit? I went back and re-listed the, <laughs> sorry, excuse me, re-listened to that episode. That dude was something. Go ahead, Carrie. <laughs> so this guy was um, kind of considered a, a futurist. He was a, uh, he had some kind of um, medical event and then he, had what he described as like an, an awakening where he felt that he was able to access prophecy. Um, I've listened to a bunch of the episodes with him, so I've probably got them all sort of blended up in my head. But the, what he really became known for was um, his prophecy about earth changes, specifically about flooding of the coastal areas of like the Mississippi River Valley. So if you put into your search engine, Gordon Michael Scallion maps 
you will get these images of these maps that he would conveniently sell that would oh, yeah. show um actually i think i think the whole earth but i remember the yeah. one oh wow that's a I cool had a couple one. I, I had them ready it just wouldn't load so cool so yeah so um it looks like we don't really um the mississippi is very wide now um <laughs> very we, wide we no longer have a west coast um the east coast doesn't look like the worst we we, we lost the tip of florida but so that's anyhow right. he he uh that was kind of his thing, and it was all about flooding, earthquakes. Um, I think Palm Beach was supposed to get hit by an eight magnitude earthquake. So, um, and he also, of course, with prophecy, they always like to give the year, sometimes even the month and the year. Yes. And I should say, fortunately, Mr. Scallion's predictions have not come true. Not even um, close. <laughs> not even close. I'm pretty sure sea levels aren't even that um, that change. And I think, uh, as far as I know, I am not a uh, a scientist here. But anyhow, I kind of dug around to see if he is still around. The most recent update I could find on his website was in February of 2020. Um, and there's. There, there, there's Reddit threads. There's, there's actually still a ton of information. And his website alone, I mean, it's very interesting reading. So, but he liked to make his predictions, and uh, he and Art had um, had a lot of episodes together. I found some in '93, '94. I think there was one in like '02. So, um, but you know, these people who like to do predictions and prophecy, I know it's good entertainment. That's why they do it. Yes. Um, to me, that's that's kind of that's kind of a shaky thing because you can either backpedal on it and explain away why stuff didn't happen, or you can keep putting it out into the future or whatever the case may be. So sometimes these people may come across as uh, as hucksters, but I just view post uh, as entertainment and and leave it at that. And yes, so I'm. We'll talk a little more down down below about what we chatted about before. But yeah, I grew up, like like I've said to many people, you know, in an 80s evangelical home, you know, with um, Thief in the Night, End of the World movies, and Jack Van Impey on TV. And I, it always bugged me how a guy like Jack Van Impey, for instance, could literally predict the end of the world every year. And people just kept coming back to him for more and more. So I guess, you know everybody's entitled to make their money. Everybody's entitled to do what they want, but yeah, it was, it, it's tough. This, this guy, I mean, he, and here's the thing you, you wonder if Michael Scallion, maybe, maybe he had um, a brain problem or so. I don't know because he, he told the story that he was a guy that would go and work in business, you know, big business for two or three months at a time, make a shit ton of money and then go spend as much time as he could on his sailboat which was cool. And then one day he's doing a presentation for a, I think it was a, a school board or something. And he just lost his voice, completely lost his voice, went to the hospital and was having visions. So to me, that almost sounds like the dude maybe had a little stroke or some kind of, mm -hmm. you know, so whatever. But um, I've got a little piece to play here. We'll play about a minute of it. And it just, it's uh, art in him carrying on about the earthquake that was supposed to happen in California uh, this episode was from 1995. I want to get down to a few specifics, and then we'll get back to the general stuff, because um, I've got a lot to ask. <laughs> Palm Springs. Um, where are we in the four-quake scenario? There was a, uh, a recent uh, seven- and then six-point quake, I believe, in the Philippines. And we're all trying to design it. There was another one previous to that in Japan, uh, or off the coast, I'm sorry, of Japan. And so where are we in this cycle? And it will culminate, you feel, in Palm Springs, correct? Correct. Um, the, uh, the scenario for, for people who are first-time listeners is that uh, four quakes uh, would occur in a, serial, in, in a scenario. What I try to look for is early warning signs, things that we can, rather than say that this is going to happen in the state, I try to back up and look for other things that would warn us about these things. And, and what I find is that... Uh, uh, what I forecast earlier this year was that um, in January, February, a cycle would begin, and it would start in Japan, and then from, it would 
be followed by a quake within weeks rather than months mm -hmm. um, in the Indian Ocean of South Pacific, and then within weeks rather than months again by another one in South America, and finally on the west coast of America. And the first uh, cycle was that they would be six magnitude 6.5. And the first cycle did occur, and it did complete itself. The last sure. quake was uh, 6.5. Uh, so, yeah, th that's him. So he goes on to say that there's going to be magnitude 8.5 five in California and that, you know, basically that I wouldn't say the end of the world, but pretty damn close. You know, it was, it sounded nasty and he spent a lot of time. He uses language that sometimes fortune tellers will use, you know, weeks, not months, like vague general. I mean, he makes predictions, but they're kind of uh, broad stroke predictions, you know, yeah. but, Art seemed to love the dude. That he respected him. They, the conversations they had were, I mean, Art, Art was very earnest with him, and he you give him the time of day. It was you could you know there were times when you could tell that he didn't necessarily agree or he, he didn't believe the person. But I, I feel like I don't know what you think, but um, with George, he seemed like or Gordon, sorry, that either he believed him or he he gave him some credence anyway. Yeah, I mean, Art certainly never dunked on anybody, and for all we know, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna put myself, you know, in in Gordon's shoes for a minute. Sure. What if I start receiving the kind of information that he ends up conveying, and I have this very strong intuition that something is going to happen? I'm gonna feel compelled to tell people. So, it's you know, I, and I, I'm I'm kind of naturally skeptical. Of course, I think that's healthy, but just because uh, he's receiving this information and conveying it, I don't see a problem there. So, and I also do believe that there are some of us, actually most of us um, have uh, intuitive abilities and that they can be accessed and used and cultivated and that sort of thing. Um, I think we have a little more than just the, the typical senses that we talk about, but um, it is a little bit, uh, dismaying when you know there's like this huge list of you know everybody's predictions that never ever came true <laughs> you know right. so and and mr scallion is definitely on that list and i it's yeah because i mean he was very much convinced he he would describe his visions in great detail you know he would talk about the glass falling out of the windows and earthquakes and the the amount of uh, flooding that would happen i, I think for what and, and here's the thing about most of Art's guests, no matter whether you want to believe them or not, the people he brought on, especially guys like Gordon Michael Scallion, believe what they're saying. And I think they were acting out of, you know, uh, altru. I hope they were acting out of altruistic motives. You know, I agree. I didn't pick up on any, especially from him. I didn't pick up on anything that seemed sketchy or you know malevolent it just you know some of them are more earnest than others but mm -hmm. i can understand why they're coming from that position so i wanted to throw this out here pack rat just said remember nasa engineer e edgar c wisenant he fancied himself a bible student and predicted the rapture would occur in 1988 sometime between september 11th and the 13th and he wrote a book called 88 reasons why the rapture will occur in 1988 no man knoweth the day or the hour. And uh, I think I found that book on Amazon one day. And I also want to say that I believe he either wrote a sequel called 89 Reasons or 90 Reasons. I can't remember. <laughs> so, I mean, that takes balls. Let's just put it that way. 89 Reasons I Need to Keep Making Money on This Topic. <laughs> that's what it was. And that's that's a sin. You know, that to me is like, ah, uh, yeah, no, I've had enough of that. Yeah. So our next guest, and it was cool that you, or, or yeah, the guest we're going to talk about, it was cool you mentioned this to me or sent this one to me because I this was one of the first episodes I found of our, after I got out of his ghost ones, and it's mm -hmm. Philip Hogue, uh, Rational Preparedness, because I, I typed in one day, I'm like, I wonder if he's ever interviewed any preppers or anything. Well, man, that is a great episode. It is. The dude, I'm, he spends three hours giving practical down to earth um prepping advice i'm yep. you can tell he's concerned a bit he's talking about the need for bunkers 
uh, you know, talking about how to survive it, but how it's funny how much of what he teaches in there is exactly what most of us practical preppers today talk about. You know, right. I just just had a chat with Dave Jones the other day about nuclear and that sort of thing. And, and Dave is very much like, hey, it might not be a good thing, but it's easily survivable if you're careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Philip was a, that was a really well balanced approach. Um, he he did not um, get steered, nor did Art try to steer him into like the kind of doom porn yeah. aspect of things. And this was in ninety seven, which so. was before. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like it, like I said, I I should have I got to re listen to that episode because. The earliest I can find the word prepper on the internet was 1999. So he was talking mm -hmm. about preparedness and that sort of thing. But he wrote a book called No Such Thing as Doomsday, Underground Shelters, How to Prepare for Earth Changes, Wars, and Other Threats. And like I said, it was a great kind of three-hour interview. And you said this was something that got you thinking about preparedness, was it? Yeah, so I probably heard... Um, it was probably a replay of that episode because I wouldn't have been listening to Art live in '97. So I, but they would do the somewhere in time episodes yeah. on Saturdays. So it was probably that's probably when I heard it. And this would have been just post 9/11. This would have been 2002, 2003 when I had that security okay. job. So uh, yeah, so between like listening to that and having it presented to me as this methodical process that you could do um to give yourself a buffer from all kinds of bad things happening um that definitely got me in the right direction i actually i don't own that book um there are copies still on amazon they're not too expensive i'm sure it's out of print it's uh the the uh reviews on it are very good um there it's apparently like over 300 pages so it's like quite you know full of practical information so i'll probably grab a copy just to have it on the shelf i think i'm gonna too just because it's kind of one of those you know prepping connections to um art bell i thought it was neat i yeah, yeah. um i so did you try to dig anything up on philip hogue at all i did and i couldn't find anything at all he's like a ghost I, yeah yeah i can <laughs> find the listing for the book i found I couldn't even really find him referenced on Reddit or on the old Bell Gab forums. And as far as I can tell, I think he was only interviewed one time. I think so too. I, man, I've done a ton of search and looking for that guy. And so there was, it was funny because the whole episode, the dude comes across is I think pretty level headed, but there's that little bit in the middle where Art starts talking about Elizabeth Clare Prophet. And, um, which was, she was, um, a cultist or something in Bozeman, Montana, where Philip lives. And she had some really wacky beliefs and they bought up a bunch of land there. And I don't know if he was a follower or if he just was a friend of hers, because there's some news articles I found where he talked about her. And then there was a bit of a lawsuit where they respread the land back out. I, anyway, that, but that was in the nineties. It looks like he founded a company called Adventure Food Company, which I think was maybe a bit of a freeze-dried thing. Mm -hmm. And I found one article recently from 2022. A guy named Philip Hogue in Bozeman, Montana, is a, an EMT who responded to a car accident. And it sounds like it could be him, but like, I don't. How old would he have to be now? It's. I guess it's hard to say for sure. I mean, he sounded like in 97, I mean, gosh, he sounded like somebody who was probably in his 30s, at well, that's, least. Yeah, that's what I was so, thinking. So, you know, that would put him, I mean, 60? that's that's old to be working on an ambulance. <laughs> well, that's what I thought, you know, but it almost seemed like maybe it was a small town volunteer thing. I don't know, but that maybe was his it. son. Yeah, well, that's true, too. Mm -hmm. I'd love to interview the dude. Just absolutely, I, I, you know, but so if anybody out there knows if, if he's still around, you know, um, Philip H O A G. And I, I just, I'd love to just talk to him about his book. Yeah. But he's just kind of completely, he was on Art Bell and then 
things just kind of petered out. There wasn't a whole lot. He didn't have much of a trail. Like you said, I typed in his last name into the subreddit. Nothing came up. Not a single story or article about him on there. So, you know, he was, he was known for his consulting on um, underground shelters, especially that was mm. kind of his specialty. Kind of wonder if like nine 11 happened. Did he go underground? Kind of like, uh, Oh, what was the bunker movie that we were talking about not too long ago? Jake Shelter? Oh, um, no. Um, uh, going with Brendan Blast Fraser. From Blast. Blast from the past. Yeah. Did he yeah. go underground when uh, we thought things were about to get really sideways? So, Jeez, that's a great theory. I love it. I'm going to go with that. He uh, he went underground post 9-11. He's in his bunker. Yeah. Yep. I, I came across an article a while ago. Actually, it was an article and a, a bit of a video. And it was... Uh, <laughs> It actually um, fooled me for a minute. It was a guy who came out of his bunker in 2016, so 16, 17 years after with the Y2K bug. And mm -hmm. it, for about the first two minutes, it seemed like a legit interview. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, this is not true. But it was it, same type of thing, you know? Yeah. I got a little clip here from Philip's interview we can play right quick. Look, it's how to take that concern and actually what translate it. What to do? Yeah. Right. Um, all right. Well, number one, what to do. A lot of people that are listening to you right now live in the middle of Los Angeles, San Diego, Seattle, uh, Chicago, you name it, you know, big cities. Uh, what can they do? Well, obviously, what I do in the book is I kind of talk about different threats when I work through. Obviously, let's let's just look at a threat scenario. All right. Okay, what would happen if we had uh, a nuclear attack on this country? Uh, we have a very fragile infrastructure when it comes to the distribution of food. Uh, if you're in Southern California, uh, the availability of water is a very fragile infrastructure. Mm. When you start looking at how much food is on the shelves of the local grocery stores, you're looking at maximum of seven days of food supply. Uh, and uh, when you look at your dependency on the electric meter out there, uh, people just start need to start thinking, what would happen if the power went off? Not too many people have to think real hard about that. We've you got, know, uh, as I said. Yeah, so, I mean, there he is, mm -hmm. the practical stuff, you know. Yeah. And seven days worth of food in the grocery stores, what would happen if your power went off? He wasn't... You know, he wasn't talking about alien abduction or anything. Like He was just like, hey, these are the things that can happen to you on a regular basis that could have. And my mic was muted. There we go. <laughs> yeah. But he just uh, just a real practical kind of guy I, mm -hmm. talking about seven days worth of food and what would happen if your power went out, that kind of stuff. It wasn't, it wasn't fear porn. He was just saying, like, these are the things you can do. And I thought it was. I thought it was a well-balanced interview overall. Yeah, and he also touched um, quite heavily a little later on that uh, about the importance of mutual aid groups and community mm. and whatever terminology you want to use. And he made it real clear. He was like, "You're not gonna, you're not gonna pull it off by yourself. I don't care how how cool and you know he heroic it sounds. That's not how that's not how humans have have come up." So I appreciated uh, yeah. that too because. The prepper mindset in the 80s, especially, and into the early 90s was that survivalist kind of, you know, mindset where everybody was just, I'm going to be a lone wolf and go in my bunker, or go out in the woods. And yeah, it was. I, I caught that too. It was a real breath of fresh air when he said, mm -hmm. you need a community because without a community, I don't care who you are, you're, you're not going to survive anything good or bad. Well, bad mainly, but yeah. So the next one you sent me, this was a fun one, was the hail bop comet. Do you remember, are you old enough to remember the hail bop comet? Yeah, I was 14 when that was happening, so I remember oh, it. Oh, yeah, 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 so we're, yeah, that's right. I was thinking, for some reason, I was thinking you're a few years younger than me all of a sudden. I know you're not, but I just thought. I, I I'm just, not far behind you, buddy. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so when we start catching up, that we have a problem, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, yeah, I remember it being all over the news. You know, it was the comet, and then it was the, the crazy cult, the Heaven's Gate, with the, do you remember their Nike shoes? Yes. That they had a picture of they, they didn't show the bodies, but they showed the feet all clad in these beautiful 
brand new Nike shoes. Mm -hmm. So I got to share something with you. I had found this before. Well, you sent it to me anyway, but uh, let's bring this up. You guys have got to see this in all its 90s. Whoops, there it goes. Oh, yes. So it's still online. <laughs> I went down a hail bop Heaven's Gate rabbit hole a while ago. I, I can't remember exactly when it was, but it turned out that I forget how many of them actually killed themselves, but they left a few behind for whatever reason. I think it was to continue to evangelize. So somebody has kept their website alive since 1997. And yeah. if this doesn't scream 1997, I don't know what does. Like You've got this flashing animated text or GIF here. You've got mm -hmm. this kind of late 90s neon beautiful beautiful thing sorry black background <laughs> yeah yep. all the background and then all the colors everything like look at the text pink and purple and yellow and green it hurts to look at yeah yeah it, was, <laughs> it, it almost feels like some sort of like acid fe fever dream but there's still people who have stayed with the community and have kept their you know there's not much but isn't that crazy like somebody keeps paying that donate donate name fee every year and yep and you know yeah. you can you can send them at rep at heavensgate.com in case you want to get paperwork uh, <laughs> paper so it's a uh, too. Hmm. yeah i don't know it was kind of interesting the the stuff that i don't know yeah it was everywhere remember cnn was carrying it they were all yeah. and yeah. so you listened to the Coast to Coast PM episodes, did you, on Hail Bop or not? I've listened to most of them. I think there's like a three or four episode series. And I've kind of hit the highlights of each. Because I, I what I did there, so on, uh, it's called the Art Bell Tape Vault for anybody out there who's wondering. You can subscribe to it in your podcast. There's an Art Bell fan who just keeps uploading old episodes. It's great. And he did a, he's about a four hour compilation of all the hail bop kind of stuff and i gotta say i art bell was at his best when he was covering a breaking news story he would have mm -hmm. been I, I mean i'm glad he didn't handle the normal everyday news but when he was handling a breaking news story or something really fresh you could tell he got right excited and right passionate about what he was talking about mm -hmm. Because he brought on, do I have his name here? Uh, I don't right now. Guy out of Texas who took the original pictures through a telescope of hale -Bop that made everyone in the world think, well, not everyone, but a few people, that there was something trailing it. Remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they said they could see like a, a heat signature that was warmer than the tail of the comet, which if it's made up of ice then okay so they say there's this ufo hiding within the trail of the comet i'm not sure how one comes to that conclusion but i, I you know and the guy was a amateur astronomer astronomer his whole life and this just he seen that and he's like i think it's a ufo <laughs> oh it was chuck chuck schramek was his name okay. and so art brings on chuck and they have a a great talk about how his life has changed for the worse after taking the pictures. And then he brings on Courtney Brown, who is a remote viewer. So he claimed. <laughs> yes. Okay. I mean, I, I can review my TV remote, but now the dude, he, they make a lot of very steep claims that yes. they, he said, we had our very best man on it. We had three people who had to do a blind review or a blind viewing of what this is. And then they basically went into this like Star Wars story about how it was aliens coming. And oh, my God, it was. Well, the guy was absolutely. Con I mean, he said he had pages and pages and pages of this remote viewing report that he was still he. He made it sound like he was flipping through those pages as he's talking to Art Bell, trying to read the results from these remote viewers. Mm -hmm. And before this whole episode started, Art has this great disclaimer. He said, I want to let you know, we're talking about first contact tonight with alien life. And it's to the best of our knowledge, it's true. This is not a drama. 
And if you're scared easily, you should turn off your radio or change the station. And if you're a parent, you should keep your kids away from the radio. Art was always a showman. And this mm-hmm. reminds me of, you know, the War of the Worlds type thing, right? Yep. Like, I, and the thing is, Art, so you remember how we talked last time about whether we thought Art had some staged guests, mainly around the Area 51 thing? Right. And I kind of come out on the side of, I thought maybe he did. But I have changed my opinion on that since I've listened to a bunch more episodes and the coast to coast PM episode about the area 51 caller. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I I think that there were people who came on who were disingenuous. And I think there are people who came on to make up stories. I don't think art ever knew it. And part of the reason I say that is what happens in the hail bop episode. Did you catch when they bring uh, Courtney Brown back on and he plays the, was it recording? It was a, a voicemail that Courtney left Art. Did I don't catch- think I heard that part. Okay. So it's pretty intense. So I'm going to paint this picture for people so you can know. But so Courtney Brown was the guy who comes on. He remote views. A few days later, Courtney and this other guy send a picture to him that they say is from um, a high up scientist at a university. It comes from Hawaii or something like that. Chuck bases all of his astral projections on this. And the very next night, well, no, about a week later, th- this guy, is. They, he said, I'm going to give him a week and then I'm going to come on the show and explain where these pictures came from. Well, it turns out the pictures were 100% fraudulent. And Art comes on the show and basically offers an apology or the closest thing to it. Like, hey, these second photos we had are doctored. They turned out they were taken a few months previous from another telescope. They were turned black and white. So Art calls Courtney back on the show. And I forget who the other guest is, but they basically lambaste the dude. Art's like, do I have your permission to play this private voicemail? (laughs) The guy didn't know it was going to happen. You can tell. Things get super heated. And Art's like, yeah, it's almost uncomfortable. I remember sitting, Mm -hmm. I was sitting in a parking lot eating my lunch and i'm like oh this is good shit <laughs> <laughs> so he's like just give me the name of the guy give me the name you know so art took it from this where art really thought this was a legit thing to i've been duped i'm going to be honest about it now let's turn it into good radio again yeah it was it was heated if anybody wants to have some fun that four hour kind of clip show of the hail bot saga is awesome um, what do we got here? Uh, Pack Rat says, uh, March 28th, 97, UPI story about the Chuck Schramek photos maybe helping to trigger the Hel- Heaven's Gate death still online. So there is a lot of that. And I'm looking forward to listening to the three-part series from Coast to Coast PM because they do quite a breakdown. Did you catch some of it? Uh, yeah, I did. So did we, yeah, they they did a really good job covering that. And to kind of tie it together, for people who maybe weren't around when this happened or, or don't recall it all that much, although it was all over everything, the the members and the leader, Marshall Applegate, the, the leader of that cult, believed that there was a UFO on the trail of this comet and they were going to end their earthly incarnation so that their souls could board that ship and head on out into the great beyond. So... Yeah, so there's all these, um, like those photos that, that mentioned there. Um, I just read, not too long before we got online, I just read kind of a, a synopsis of the how that cult was formed. It changed. It had been around for, it had been around since the early 70s. It was really? not a brand new thing. Yeah. So, uh yeah, there's old Mr. Applegate there. They so yeah, basically they were trying to get on board the UFO because they they believe that they were alien beings within a human appearing shell. Um, who knows? I wasn't there, but uh, but they did. They drank a uh, it was about thirty something people, like thirty five people, and they drank uh. Some kind of barbiturate mixed with vodka, which uh, that's a bad combo. 
Sure. I'll definitely do it. So um, I, I remember um, they kept showing the video of Applegate on television, him giving his like little manifesto and stuff. Right. I remember watching it with mom. He wouldn't blink. He doesn't blink in any of that. It is bizarre. So, uh, yeah, but the guys on Coast to Coast PM did a really good breakdown of it. Um, it was uh, quite the saga for most of that year, really. Yeah, and uh, whatever you want to th- – like, here's the thing. You you can blame Art whatever you want. Art Art didn't give him the barbiturates. Art didn't give him – you know, he – Art did what art does. He he's a showman who presents stories and tells things. And yeah, I I don't know. I mean, and when I heard that part of where he came back on and basically lambasted Courtney Brown about the fake photos, I thought, you know what? That's just art treating it, you know, as as it comes along and figuring out, okay, that this is not. I need to go back and fix this, right? So I don't. Right. Yeah, I, I don't. I it is. Yeah. Let's um, let's play a little clip real quick of this episode just so you can hear it. I, I got a fax earlier tonight from Chuck Schrammick in Houston. He works for the FM side of my affiliate in Houston, KTRH, and it says the following, urgent, <laughs> strange object sighted near Hale-Bopp. Art, I have just taken some amazing pictures of Hale-Bopp. They show a Saturn-like object near the comet. This thing, if it's solid and near the comet, would be four times the size of the Earth. I've called Hoagland, meaning Richard Hoagland. He says there have been other calls about this strange thing that just showed up tonight. To see it, and then he gives his website address, well, we, because we knew the traffic would be uh, astoundingly large, and it is large, we put it up on my webpage, and I thank Chuck for that, and I'm sitting here look, looking at the photograph right now. It is a gigantic object. And it, uh, it seems to have just appeared. And we're talking with Professor Courtney Brown. And we'll get to, back to the professor in a moment. But once again, for the sake of the audience, who probably is saying to themselves, what the hell is he talking about? I want to bring back Chuck, who took the photograph, an amateur astronomer in Houston, Texas. Um, uh-oh. So yeah, that you can just hear it in Art's voice, this breaking story he's he's super excited to talk about. And mm-hmm. you can tell that it yeah, it's something fresh. I love, of course, you know, anybody who's younger than us are like, what the hell's a fax? But Art <laughs> relied on his fax machine back in the day. Yeah. And you gotta think about how um exciting it would have been to have something come through like that while he's live on the radio. Because we're we're so spoiled by our access to information, and in some ways it's kind of a letdown because of the amount of BS you have to learn how to sift through and to have discernment. So, you know, so the, so those photos were eventually debunked. Those are the same photos we're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. The, whatever they but, were, were it's hard to say. They, but the, as far as what scientists say, it was either like not lens flares, but reflections or light or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. But maybe that astronomer, do we think maybe he was genuine in what he believed he was seeing, but that the photos were just not representing what they believed to be kind of thing. Absolutely. And again, absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind that that Chuck Schramek was 100% genuine in what he shared. You know, he's a dude that has spent his whole life looking at the skies He saw something that totally freaked him out. And he's like, who can I tell about this that will believe me? Art Bell. And so, you know, you have Art who is genuinely allowing people to come on his show. And you have Chuck who found something. And that's it. You know, he he wasn't a professional astronomer. He was, um, you know, an amateur one. So he he didn't have the gear. He didn't have the understanding. But the guy was a radio guy. And releasing those pictures ended up ruining his life for at least a period of time mm-hmm. because he caught a lot of shit for it and, you know, a lot of backlash. So I don't know. The guy didn't do it to be disingenuous again. I know that's a term we use a lot here, but it's true. He just wanted to share his story. 
So let's go on to Area 51 because I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Because did you listen to the Area 51 show from the Coast to Coast PM boys? I did. I listened to the whole thing. That is a trip, is it not? It's like, hold on to your hat because you just, you think, okay, so it, this is what happened. And then there's like another layer and then another layer. It's incredible. I I didn't put this one in here, but did you, um, the Amityville Horror, did you listen to that episode at all? Mm-hmm. You need to listen to that one because okay. the, the dudes, the guys that do Coast to Coast PM, they do some awesome research. And the Area 51 was great. But I think I enjoyed the Amityville one even more. It was really cool. I don't want to spoil it for you. So you listen to it. Anybody else out there, maybe we'll add that to our third episode because it was good. So we shared the Area 51 audio last time. The dude sounds legit panicked. And I'm going to, I'll stage it for you guys so you know. Art was obsessed with Area 51. It was the 90s when everybody was wondering what the hell was going on in Nevada there. And he said, I'm going to make an open line for employees of Area 51. This guy calls on and says, you know, they're after me. And the crazy thing is, as he's talking, the radio station dies. There, Art loses all transmission and there's no known reason for it. Now, I kind of posited last time that I thought maybe Art was in on this. It seemed too good to be true. And after listening to the Coast to Coast PM guys, I have no doubt that I'm 100% wrong about that. Um, And the other one that got me that way was Mel's Hole. And I I want to do some more research in that one. But after listening to so many more interviews, I don't think Art was in on it. But I think sometimes, maybe at least with the Mel's Hole, Art's like, this is too good not to share. But in his head, he's like, I think this guy's loopy, you know? But he's playing along. Yeah. Yeah. So do you want to share a little bit about how this Area 51 story ends up? Because we get a total resolution about this. Yes. So let's see if I'm recalling this sequence of events correctly. The original call happens. Um, Art gets knocked off the air. When he gets back on the air, he actually has his, not the producer, but somebody involved in the engineering of the show, come on and say, and explain what happened. And and according to this lady, the feed from the satellite was disconnected. The thing that was weird was that that particular satellite broadcasted multiple stations, not just what Art was on. Everybody else stayed on only art's feed was cut which she said ought to be impossible she Um, said they said legit yeah yeah it lost earth contact is what they were saying so it was like misaligned right okay so there was that um and now then apparently not too long after a guy calls in and confesses to being the caller and that it was a a prank and he's a comic book writer, and he was doing this to kind of, he was just kind of playing into the theme for the night. Is that fairly correct? Okay, I think I'm going to back up just a little because I don't, okay, when the guy called back to admit to it, he admitted he was the caller, but I don't think the comic book writing thing came out till years later. Okay. Because the Coast to Coast PM, and this is why I'm quoting them, because They deserve all the credit for this part because they played a clip from another podcast, um, which I have on my phone here, but from many, many years later. Who was it? I think it was the George Knapp show. Maybe it was. I can't remember, but it was like from 2017, 20, Mm -hmm. like a long, many, many years later because the guy came back on. But I think the real story was, it's, it's incredible. Let me bring this up here, guys, so you can see this. I'm going to explain it for anybody on audio. This guy, you're probably wondering why I have some, you know, comic book writing looking dude on Wikipedia, but his name's Brian J.L. Glass. And he is an American comic book writer known for such works as The Mice Templar. He's worked for Image Comics, Marvel Comics, including Thor, First Thunder, and Valkyrie. So the guy's fairly well known. Now, he called in 
back in whatever year it was in the 90s to Art Bell, like Carrie said, and said, I'm, I'm this guy. This is 100% true at this point. We know this. So unfortunately, the Area 51 guy was a hoax. He calls back in, and like Skyler, or Stryker says here, the Area 51 panic caller called many years later and confessed to faking it. It was him who called in again. Many years after that, we find out that it was this guy and that he was doing it to promote or to kind of, I don't know, maybe he was inspired by his comic book story. Here's the, yeah, here's the absolute insane thing, guys. So the guy was a fake, 100%. But <laughs> the fact that the radio station went down, I'm even getting chills talking about this, was not fake. So mm -hmm. what do you Somebody think? Somebody thought he was serious. A hundred percent. I It blows me out of the water. This mm -hmm. dude, this comic book creator who was living in his parents' basement, calls in to fake pretending he's from Area 51 in some alphabet agency who's listening on the other end, shuts the signal off because they think he's legit. Mm -hmm. I, what do you do? Yeah. Like, that is, that's friggin' incredible. <laughs> yeah. So in some ways, like it's, it's more telling the fact of what happened with a hoax than if the caller had legitimately been an employee there. I think it's a better story. I, honestly, I think because there's, like you said, there's, there's about three twists to it where you, mm -hmm. and there's all these layers. And I wonder if Art ever found out about this because I, I don't know. I, I love it. I, it just, I couldn't believe it. And for the guy to tell it and he, and he tell you, he has an interview, he's on this other podcast and the guy's like, listen, that was not planned. That disconnection was 100% legitimate. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I think it's freakier and a little bit scarier knowing that than thinking it was, you know, some Area 51 dude who got shot or whatever. Because originally you think, okay, it's an Area 51 guy who got found out and they shut him off right there and they took him away, right? Then right. years later, you're like, oh, all right, the dude comes back and he says it was fake. Okay, well, that's what we know. Well, it turns out that it was fake, but the disconnection wasn't. So, ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Gives me chills even thinking about it now. Yeah, when I was listening to that, I was I was on a job building these raised beds um, on this property that has some pretty heavy-duty surveillance going on. Like, I mean, it's a residence, but they really like their surveillance. Yep. And uh, not only, I mean, they've got like the, not just the cameras, but the audio and everything too. And I kind of forgot about it because I'm listening to this and, I, and I'm sitting down and I remember going, no fucking way. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, camera. Well, sorry. Sorry about that. <sighs> but it was just one of those, like, I was so engrossed. I was assembling these beds. I was just putting all these little screws together and everything. And I was just like, boom. <laughs> yes. I, it, it, so there's a, that and um, Cam and Colby, the casual preppers, they, if you ever listen, do you listen to them or not? I don't, I've got a few of theirs, yeah. They're hilarious. And I, some mornings I'll be out blowing snow and I'll be listening to their episode and I will laugh out loud. And I'm thinking <laughs> if anybody's watching me, they're going to think I'm a madman, you know? Yeah. Maybe not madman Markham, but ma a madman nonetheless. Right. You know? But I think there's more we could talk about Mr. Time Traveler sometime too. But Oh, yeah. So the next one is the Phoenix Lights. Did you do you remember that or do you did you follow that at all? Because this was one I added to my list. Um I'm familiar with like the phenomenon, but I don't recall specifically how art addressed it. So Okay. I'm all so ears. It this was fun. I here it is first, guys. So this has nineties written all over it. So the and this was an episode again that art treated it was a breaking story. He gets reports while he's live on the air of these five lights in the sky for an hour and a half in Phoenix. People see them. They make a triangle. It legit looks like, so it says right here, for 106 minutes on March 13th, people saw something like this V-shaped object flying over Arizona. UFOs, the only thing that's certain is that it still haunts them. So, that's kind of creepy in and of itself. There's been mm -hmm. newer renditions since. Art brings on a local city councillor. Actually, first off, he gets 
emails. Um, oh, 99P from Twitch says, I happen to know a bit about UFOs. I'd <laughs> Could I join the debate? <laughs> i tell you what, <laughs> if you email me at therealtimcook at gmail.com, I'd gladly bring you on the next episode. I would love to have another. That'd be fun to have three of us, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm all in. Absolutely. So the Phoenix Lights, really interesting. The story goes later on that the official narrative is that it was Air Force flares that were dropped with um, balloons or, um, you know, uh, parachutes or something. Who knows what happened? It, honestly, the truth behind it doesn't really matter per se. It's the story and how Art mm -hmm. unveils it. So he, he, he gets a fax live and he reads it. And let's see if we can find... All right, here we go. Let's see if we can put it. Island, south into South America, north well to the pole, and worldwide on the Internet, this is Coast to Coast AM. And it's a hot time in the old town tonight. Things are popping. Peter Davenport, um, who is at the Seattle UFO Reporting Center, has a lot to tell us about what's been going on this evening, this night. Uh, perhaps even now in the skies over Arizona and elsewhere. So we're going to get a quick report from Peter Davenport. Then we're going to go to Sean David Morton, who is... You know, we'll have to ask him about that. Really a prophet, I guess, an investigative reporter, uh, certainly for many uh, TV programs and uh, so forth and so on, uh, regarding UFOs. And he's got three new UFO photographs that you've never seen before, but can see right now because we've got them up on the website. Uh, one of them uh, allegedly taken from inside a UFO <laughs> of a Pleiadian... Uh, so, I, yeah, we'll leave it at that. It, what's that? The Pleiadians. I I hear them. We're still talking about the Pleiadians in it, some circles. It was, yeah. So this whole episode, he starts with the breaking story of the lights in Phoenix. And as he's on the air, he starts getting flooded with emails. We're seeing lights. What's going on? I don't know what happened. So the next night, he has an episode where... He brings on a few people. Uh, he ties in. Have you ever heard Richard Hoagland? He makes the prediction. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he ties into, oh, my God. I listened to the whole interview with Richard Hoagland, and I'm like, so this dude bases his predictions on Egyptian timelines or Roman time. I can't remember. it. The guy is like 100% convinced he's it's it's science he says all my predictions are science and then he starts talking about the date that nasa lands on mars and how it ties in with some astrological calendar and i'm like whoo it's tough yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so richard hoagland claimed that he predicted the lights in phoenix but the craziest thing is again and i loved it because it's a breaking story art brings on a city councilor from phoenix so here's the thing it's pretty cool, this episode, because the Phoenix Lights happen. Nobody talks about it for like three months. And then all of a sudden, all at once, every major news studio runs a story about the Phoenix Lights for no reason. They just all at once. And Art, Art is playing his conspiratorial mindset. He's like, well, what's going on? Is somebody feeding them the stories? So he brings on the local city councilor who they're trying to do the local version of impeach. They're trying to get rid of her. She doesn't get along with the governor. Everybody's putting pressure onto the governor to do an investigation into what these lights are. He asks her what her opinion is. The governor says, okay, we're going to have a press conference and we're going to look into what the hell's going on. The governor is also being indicted at this point. He's um, facing charges. He's in court every day for, I didn't dig into what it was about, but it seemed semi-serious. So the governor in the morning or at lunchtime says, we're going to have a press conference. In the evening, after he leaves court, he calls a press conference live on TV and out walks one of his aides in an alien shirt, an alien mask. It was a complete farce. Or, here's the thing, wow. either the dude was playing everyone or like she said, somebody got to him and he's like, I can't do this. So now we need to play it off as a joke. 
Wow. Yeah. So this lady was not happy. She said she was at home eating her supper, watching this live press conference. And one of his aides comes out in an alien suit and she was totally dismayed. So they didn't know what to do at that point. She was in a big fight with him. She said that wasn't like him to do that. He was usually very serious and not a joking type person. So there, there's all these conspiracies going on. And Art does a wonderful job of tying his guests and his live calls into this story because he, he, he talks about the, the facts as he gets. Then he interviews the city councilor. And then he ties it all into these predictions. And he brings Richard Hoagland on, who then explains why the date that the Mars rover, this was about the time the Mars rover was supposed to land on Mars. Okay. And he says they're going to lose contact for three or four days or something. And then when it lands, the date has to do it. So he makes these predictions based on that. And it's a great three hour episode that just goes through all the highs and the lows. And like I said, if they were flares, great. If they were UFOs, even better. But the journey of the episode was a ton of fun. Definitely it, have to put that one on the playlist then. Yes, I will. Uh, I'll see if I can. Well, I, it was uh, 1997, March 13th was the episode. All and right. it was it was awesome. It was it was fun. And I'd forgotten all about the Phoenix Lights until I came across. Like, Phoenix? Oh, I remember those, you know, because mm-hmm. again, being a, an alien head in high school, I, I remember thinking, oh, man, I'd love to see something like that. So I got one more for you. This is the one I told Carrie before we started that I had a a surprise or it's one. So I found out about this individual on Reddit again, because I love, you know, going through the, the art bell subreddit. And this guy, this show, if you haven't listened to it, Carrie, you need to. So I'm going to ask you, do you know, or have you ever heard of Mr. Fidget? No, I don't think so. Oh, you are in for a treat, my friend. Oh, right. So first off, I I know about a week ago in the subreddit, the Art Bell, R slash Art Bell, somebody comes on and they're like, I just listened to the Mr. Fidget episode. Where can I find more about this dude? And then I go down to read the comments and there's a few people who say about every six months, somebody comes to the Art Bell subreddit who has stumbled across the Mr. Fidget episode and they're just blown away by it. So I'm going to paint you a picture. Art Bell is sent these fidgets. Now, not fi- you remember the fidget spinners from a few years ago? Mm-hmm. It's not that guy. This is a guy who lives, I wouldn't say on the streets in California, but he sounds like he doesn't have a ton of money. So the guy sends Art Bell four or five of these contraptions that supposedly will allow you to time travel. They're made out of old bike chains and keychains and things like that. And you basically twist and turn them in your hands. So the guy says they have powers to help you quit smoking, What, whatever, right? I, the dude is a very interesting dude. So Art gets them one day. Art has an interview or uh, a guest on 45 minutes into the show. Art says, I'm going to open up the, the open lines for calls. Art picks up the phone and the guy who's on the other end is Mr. Fidget. Now, Art goes on to explain that the odds of this guy getting through are about one in one million. Art has like four lines that are 100% full all the time. He said he gets reports from the 1-800 company telling them how many people don't get through. He says the odds of this dude getting through are about one in one million. The guy must have had an auto dialer or something. Now, he is, I, I wish I could remember what town he was in, but it doesn't really matter. We'll say it's Santa Barbara. I don't think it was, but he's at a phone booth out front of a grocery store after midnight, talking to Art Bell on the phone. Art is completely floored by this guy because Art says, everybody's going to think this is staged. And you can tell it wasn't. Art is legitimately like, how the hell? He, I think he even says, how the hell did you get through to my phone right now? Mm-hmm. 
So the next three hours, two and a half hours of the show is Art having an ongoing conversation with this salesman is all I can tell you, who gives people fidgets on the street in California. He's at a phone, you know, a phone booth in front of this grocery store. People start showing up. Art's talking about it on the radio. And so it becomes this like mid nineties after midnight party where a scout master who just left the scout thing shows up, a pirate radio host shows up and art brings these people on. So um, the Mr. Fidget's like, Hey, here, I'll let you talk to this guy. This guy's art says, is this really the guy? Is this? And so they spend these three hours, people phone in to talk to the guy and he, he basically sells these fidgets for about five bucks a piece. The episode is incredible. I didn't know if the guy was legitimate or not. So people claim that you could time travel with these fidgets. Well, that part wasn't necessarily true. What the guy said was, if you play with them, it'll make time pass and feel like you've time traveled. That was his whole idea. Mm. The guy tells his whole life story about you know, being brought up and kicked out of a bunch of different foster homes. And then he tells the story of how he sold everything. You know, the guy at first, he's a really interesting dude. And as he goes along, you almost think he's a bit of a shyster or maybe a salesman, but it's so genuine. Art just, Art opens the lines and starts letting the guy answer from the phone booth, all these people who just call and ask him these questions. It is one of the craziest up and down episodes you'll ever find. And the problem is, I think the guy got in over his head because as the story goes, he gave out his address to sell fidgets for $5. Apparently a metric shit ton of people sent this guy $5 for fidgets. Nobody ever got a fidget. <laughs> oh. So I had to dig. The guy... Uh, let's, I got to show you this. So okay. let's see if we can find it here. Actually, you know what, before we do that, let's minimize this. Let's go back here. I'm going to play just a quick little clip from it. I don't believe you got through. I, well, I, I told you, Art, I know your phone system better than you do. No, you don't. That's impossible. I have, um, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five active lines right now. It's inconceivable. Everybody is going to swear that we're in cahoots or something. I know it. It's, it, it, it's not possible. It's the not... truth is, I'm standing at a payphone, Art. It's no. A, absolutely. I'm at a payphone. Here's the delivery truck in the background. Prove it. Okay, here. I'll pick up the other phone next door. There's the dial phone from the other phone. Uh, Here's the other phone hanging up. See, I'm a dual dialer, Art. I dial on two lines simultaneously because I'm fully ambidextrous. I've been using these fidgets for six years. I got a dexterity that you wouldn't believe. I really want to be studied. I'm prepared to get on the EKG. They can look at me, figure out what's wrong with me or what's great with me. But the reality is I'm super skilled. Wait till you see my hands in motion with these fidgets. I will blow anybody's dexterity away, reaction time, ability, because I've been practicing every day for six years. With what, 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 wait a minute. Okay. What, I, city, what city are you in? I'm in Santa Cruz, California. Santa Cruz. All yeah. right. Is there anybody around you right now? Um, there's a guy uh, sweeping the floor in the in the uh, grocery store. And that's where you are. You're you're adjacent, outside or inside or what? Yeah, I'm outside of a grocery store. How'd you like the comic book art? Yeah, there's a truck driver over there. He's uh, loading up the truck, or it's the bagel guy delivering bagels. Um, is what? there is there anybody there? That you can call to the phone. To, to confirm my story? Hey, yeah. buddy, can you uh, confirm something for me? Yeah, I got this guy walking over from a truck. Uh, uh, He's curious. So, Art, as I long as I'm on the line, yes. Okay, well, yes, why we're... can't we have me as a guest right now? Have some people who've got fidgets call in, maybe some, you know, who knows? You know I'm, not saying, I'm not saying we can't, okay. actually. I'm... That would be fun. So is this guy walking over? Is he yeah, think you're crazy as a loon? There's a guy with a clipboard and another guy. Um, fidget man, you know me? Now how could he know you? I'm he, just going to keep playing. He wants a fidget. Were you listening to Art Bell? Every night this guy listens. Bring right him. Here. Bring, walking up, shaking my hand here. Bring, wait, wait a minute. Hold it. Stop. Bring him, bring him to the phone. Put okay. him on. 
Yeah, I'll put him on the phone here. You're on the air live. Hey, Art. Hello there. Do you know this man? No, no, I'm making a delivery. I just heard you on the radio. What kind of work do you do? Um, delivery for uh, local stores. And you listen to my pr program? Yeah, and I pulled up um, one of our stores is by where this guy was calling, and I heard him say that he was at um, two pay phones and using two uh, two hands. And he's telling the truth. Well, I, I mean... I mean, there are two pay phones there. He's outside of a grocery store, and you're making a delivery. All that's true. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I heard it just as I was pulling up. He talked about a delivery truck, and I jumped out and yelled Art Bell, and he waved me over. <laughs> ah, so, ah, Mike. And what town are you in, please? This is Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. Absolutely true. I don't know if these things work, but um, never met the guy. But it's absolutely true. He's standing right here. Well, you're a real trooper uh, to have been doing that. Um to, to come to the phone like this. And, oh, well, uh, it's a thrill for me to talk to you. Well, it's a, it's a thrill for me to talk to you, and it's even weirder to talk to the fidget guy. Yeah. <laughs> so how crazy is that? I, I, it just blew me away. And this, this whole episode, the dude sounds like he's on meth or something. The whole like He talks like a salesman. He goes 100 miles a minute the whole time. He, he has an answer for everything. The dude is a philosopher like nobody's business. I started digging into the guy. He has an Etsy page now. So here, here's what we're going to show you first. Here, So I found this in a, a deeply buried comment on Reddit. Somebody said, apparently the fidget guy likes Anthony Robbins. And they linked to this um, Twitter feed, of Twitter profile of this guy. And it turns out his name, see if I can find it here. I don't know if I can now. Shaz. Shaz, where is it here? Let's bring it up. This is his website. I had to find it. And uh, anyway, his first name is Shaz Redetsted. He lives in Oregon now, which probably shouldn't surprise anybody. And uh, so here is his Etsy store. That's one of his little chain, uh, chain fidgets that he has. And he has this little video, and this is what it says. It says, I'm the original Mr. Fidget, crafting great bicycle chain fidgets since 1991. In 91, my bike chain broke, and when I went to put a new chain on, it was a few links too long. I bought a tool to cut the chain. I put a few links in my pocket that jiggled around with my keys. I had the idea of connecting them together. Now, nearly 30 years later, I continue to make fun chicanal art from the bicycle chain. So the dude legit still makes these things. And then now he's into like AI art and stuff. But this was, uh, there was a picture of him here. He's a a skate, you know, um, roller skater and that kind of stuff. But I just wanted to show you there. There's a picture of him in California when he gives oh, some right. really big items. Um, and yes, thank you, Packrat. Cedar Street in Santa Cruz, California. So anyway, they end up like spending the whole episode talking. Art Bell is completely blown away. So there's like I said, he brings over a truck driver. The truck driver 100% says, yep, yeah, I was listening to the show. And this is the pull that Art Bell has because all these people just start coming in on this phone booth. They come and go. And this, remember, this is from, what, midnight till whatever, you know, late in the night. And then mm -hmm. a guy a guy left a uh, <laughs> Liberty Late Night. Good to have you. Got me with Art Bell. Love Art Bell. So then, then there's a guy who left a meeting. He wasn't, uh, he, it was like a scout troop leaders meeting. He left, he shows up still wearing his scout uniform. He's there. He gets on the radio with Art. He gets talking. Then a pirate radio station who had their house tore down by the city because they were doing something illegal. He shows up. He starts rebroadcasting. He gets on the radio with Art. And the whole thing is like this mid 90 street party of this guy who sells anything and everything. And it is just the yeah. You will love it. I, um, I will, I will listen. That is one heck of a story. The only thing that I gotta know though is this guy feeding quarters into that payphone the whole time. No, because it was a one eight hundred number. He called a toll free That's number. Right. So, okay. Yeah, okay. I thought of that too. The guy stays on the phone for almost three hours, and he wow. gets into a debate with a guy. A guy calls in and. So Art opens the lines. The guy asks Art about some anti-Christian guest he had on before. So it has nothing to do with 
the fidget guy. <laughs> Art's talking to the guy. The fidget guy basically tears into him. <laughs> and but <laughs> but in a an intellectual way, like it was like the guy was meant to be on the show. So you've got to hear it. I think there may be more episodes, so I'm gonna go down. I might have to do like some little 10 minute video on the dude because there's so much to tell and it's just the strangest thing. I'm not sure how I missed that one, but I'm well, gonna make sure I, I get it's tuned a, in. It's obscure. I I didn't know anything about it until I'm in the the subreddit and they're like, You're in for a treat if you want to hear the fidget guy. Because he's not whenever you look up articles online of Art Bell's um, you know, best guests and that nobody ever mentioned some dude named the Mr. Fidget, you know? <laughs> so yeah. cool. he said he sent a comic book to art and a bunch of fidgets. And the comic book was the story of dude's life when he broke his bike chain and then started making fidgets. So yeah, it's crazy. Have a good night striker. He said, thanks for keeping the art arts legacy alive. We, we do what we can. Oh yeah. So you sent me a question, Carrie, and let's mm -hmm. finish up with this. I pinned it at the top and I'm going to ask everyone also. So of course we all know that art God rest his soul has long passed away. And Carrie sent me this question probably a month ago now when we started prepping for the show. Who would you like to see Art interview today if you could? And that night I made a list of about 10 or 12 people because that was such an interesting idea. So I'm going to throw it out, whoever's still kicking around in the chat, if you want to put it up there, who would you like to see Art interview? Now, who were your thoughts, Gary? Who, who were some of the people you thought you'd like to see interviewed with Art? So I chose two, and I I did who could who would I like to hear Art Art interview, and who would I like to hear be interviewed? Um, sure. Flip it around the other way. Yep. Uh, so I would love to hear um, Art be interviewed by uh, Greg Carlwood, who does the Higher Side Chat, which oh. is uh, the Higher Side Chat is probably one of the larger conspiracy style paranormal style uh podcast out there and he's actually been on the air a long time for podcasting i think he's almost over 10 years at this point okay so he's he's been at it for a long time he's a really good interviewer he does really good preparation for his shows and um while i've never heard greg reference art i'm sure he's aware of him um so that would be that would be something to uh to to really i would like to hear art tell his life story to somebody and greg's very good at getting getting that um out of people um and if art was still alive and could have somebody on his show there is a podcaster who goes by the name crow triple seven and oh, i've run into him somewhere on yeah okay sorry cut you off yeah, he's so so Crow is really cool and he also uh he he just questions everything. He takes nothing at, presented as, you know, he, he's he's just very he's he's a natural skeptic about all kinds of stuff, but he's very well spoken. He is uh he's also there's no he doesn't use any uh profanity or anything, which sometimes is refreshing in a podcast. Absolutely. And so I, uh, I would just, it would be two, two minds from two different spectrums, but they would, I'm sure it would be a very, um, a, a polite and a conversation with a lot of, a lot of depth and meaning if those two guys got together on the air. It, I'm sure it would be similar to some, some, um, his older interviews when he would interview people that he really got along with. And they had really good chemistry. Those are fun because you mm -hmm. hear them, you know, they, they bounce ideas. People, some of his long-term recurring guests that whether you agree with them or not would be, uh, yeah, that would be a type of interview, like you said, would be probably similar to that, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Stryker and Haas both picked people off my list, which was cool. Absolutely, Elon Musk would be a great interview if Art was still around. Wouldn't that be, think about Elon's interview on... Joe Rogan and how yeah. cool that was. <laughs> yeah. I think Elon would be great. And, and art would have the pull to get him there. Um, and then Haas said Donald Trump. So I think 
Uh, so Art was somewhere in between. I think he was a bit of a libertarian, but he wasn't a real fan of Donald Trump. There were some posts on his Facebook page that I came across because, you know, he, he passed away right at the beginning of Trump or right, right, right before he came to power. So, but it would be a really good one. Uh, yeah. Uh, Stryker says, favorite of all time was Bob Lazar. 100% believe his story. Did yeah. Did we talk about him last time? We might have touched on him a little bit. Um, he was a, uh, I think he actually would have been like an Area 51 kind of insider. Yeah. And he the right. thing about Bob, yeah, is that his story, he's told it on so many shows over so many years, decades at this point, he hasn't changed it. Right. It's consistently the same. And that's some, you know, some of these people you hear and there's, you start finding inconsistencies and embellishments and stuff. And Bob's story has been plain he, and simple the whole time. He was on Rogan. And I watched about a 10 minute clip of that. And yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, people, you, you read articles where they say that he's been debunked, but you watch Bob and Bob believes what he's saying. I don't know mm -hmm. how you take somebody who's that bright and don't at least give credence to what he's saying, you know, and that's what I think Joe Rogan is probably the closest we have to a modern day art bell because he, he like brings, that. he brings people on, lets them tell their story, treats them with dignity and respect and just lets the guest talk no matter how out there they are. And yep. Joe was actually on our show. Um, there's an episode of, or I think it was from maybe 2007, 2008. Was it, I don't know which episode it was, but so he was on there, but Joe was at the very top. So I made a long list, but I'm going to, I'm going to run through them fairly quick. But so Joe Rogan was my first, but I would like to have, I would like to hear an interview of Joe Rogan today. The Joe Rogan, who's made a hundred million dollars from Spotify and has made a living interviewing conspiracy theorists or or out their minds, right? Mm -hmm. I think they would have a hell of a time chatting back and forth. Now, my next one was Tom DeLong, and he's the lead singer of Blink-182. Do you know him at all? I'm, I'm aware of his work, yeah. Okay, so yeah. I think it would be pretty cool. The dude is, you know, he, what did he, he went to the White House one time to discuss UFOs with the president. I think it would just be a real trip of an interview. Another one, Penn Jillette. You know, from uh, Penn and uh, yeah. he yep. is such a skeptic, and he's so smart and so intelligent, so well spoken. I think it would be a a ride of an interview. Uh, Les Stroud, Survivor Man. Yep, I would love. I mean, he's had his interview on Rogan where he talked about maybe running into Bigfoot or something like that. Mm. But I I just think that uh, Les would have a great. He he would have a lot of good stories that Art would have a lot of fun with. Uh, Jordan Peterson, I'd love to hear Jordan and uh, Art, you know, because I could see, you know, Jordan is getting further and further. Like, I agree with what he talks about, but, you know, the the mainstream media really has a hard on for Jordan. They don't like him at all. So it'd be fun. Uh, Donald Trump, I had him on there. Russell Brand, I think he would be a great interview. Uh, Elon Musk and then Bill Lamar. You know, from politically incorrect. Okay. I mean, yeah. I I love that dude. He I mean he he's very left wing, but he is so smart and he has come around over the last couple of years on free speech and censorship and a whole lot of things. He would be a great interview. But those were the ones that I picked and I thought they would be a lot of fun to hear art, you know. And there is a guy who posted a video on Reddit just the other day. And it was a deep fake of Art's voice interviewing somebody today. And uh, I don't know. It Obviously, it's not the same. It's not. I don't even yeah. like the idea per se. But it's just it, this is a fun exercise to think. Who would we love to hear Art on the radio bantering back and forth with, you know? Exactly. Well, we did it, Carrie. We made another hour and a half episode. And this was it didn't even take. We didn't even have to blink. And here we are. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I think we might have to do another one of these down the road in two or three months if you're up for it. Absolutely, there's there's certainly enough out there to to dig into. I, I love it. It's fun. I, I I just like an excuse to sit down and talk to my buddy Carrie too because you know it. Um, although we will see each other in April, right? 
Oh yeah. Yep. You're, you're going to LFTN for sure. Indeed. I'll be there. Yep. Perfect. So for those who might live in the Tennessee area or who might need some permaculture help or that sort of thing, how do people find you, Carrie? Because this is so far off of what we normally talk about that uh, they might not realize that you're an expert on something. Yeah, I can help you um, with your gardens and your property, and I can also help you look for UFOs. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, the website strongrootsresources.com, and I I do I assist people in evaluation of their property for uh, homestead design, edible landscape design. Uh, wild edible foraging. I've been going on the properties and helping people ID things and getting labels on the trees. Not those kind of edibles. Oh, my oh, find, Sometimes we find that in the woods too. It happens. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anything I can do to help people get their property, be productive. Um, I'm, I'm game to do it. I've, I've had a nice run of consults lately with a couple more on the books. So I like it when people keep me busy on that. Nice. And Carrie is just, yeah. So Carrie's coming by to help consult on the 10 acres we bought in Tennessee. So, you know, and how far do you travel? You're, you're close to the Knoxville area, right? Yeah. I'll, I'm comfortable traveling about four hours in any direction from Knoxville. Okay. So, And that's not to say that uh, if it's a little bit further, if I can line up a few in the general area, you know, I'll kind of like schedule a little tour just to make the, make the miles work better. And, um, uh, people can always reach me by email too. Even, you know, I, I can, I can assist to a degree with photographs and maps and that kind of thing. I just, basically I don't charge quite as much because I'm not spending as much travel time, but, uh, yeah, I can help, uh, even at a distance if people want to get in touch with me. Cool. Yes. And, uh, if we happen to see a, an unidentified flying balloon, I mean, uh, object, you can help <laughs> us identify that too. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's National UFO Reporting Center dot com, and that's uh, I bet they've been busy lately. I yeah. Apparently, there's a bunch of uh, the cigar shaped style that come around on my end of the state. I've never seen one, but those are the most common ones reported. Well, you know what? When we do this next time, um, maybe we'll have to come back with the best UFO story from our area. I think that'd yeah. be a lot of fun. We, we can share that too. And I'm also thinking way ahead we need to do our own version of ghost to ghost for halloween so yes we, yeah we need yes. to get everybody in the community to share mm -hmm. with us their personal go i think oh yeah it'll be fun we'll have fun with it carrie so i'm i'm down cool all right brother uh thank you you can hang for a second I'm, we're, we're just going to close up here guys first off i appreciate you um i know this is slightly different than some of the stuff we cover but not really we, we cover everything. If you're new listening to this Art Bell show and you're like, who's that crazy bald dude on there from Canada? Well, we talk about preparedness. We talk about repairedness, which is home maintenance, which is crazy. Quite often, we'll even talk about post-apocalyptic fiction because we have a lot of fun with that. I try to inspire people to build the business they want and just get out and get shit done. And we have a great anarchist community here. And I don't mean the anarchists who are Bond villains. I mean people who believe in freedom of choice and the freedom to associate with or without whomever we choose. And a free market. So that's who we are. That's what we stand for. And guys, as always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week. <laughs>